You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome to the Barbell Logic Podcast. I am here with my good friends Andrew Jackson and Nikki Sims. Uh, they have been regulars on the show lately, mostly just because we've been hanging out a bunch together after what appears to have been 20 or 30 years of not seeing another human. We've been <laughs> able to hang out. And so we got lots of fun stuff to talk about. And I thought it'd be fun to do a Q&A with you guys. And rather than Scott uh, ask the questions to me and where I had to field the questions, I'm going to do that to you and we'll see what your answers are. And then Uh-oh. at the end, I'll give my answer, which will be the more correct answer to the <laughs> cues. So I feel like we're on jeopardy. Yeah, cool. it's what it is. <laughs> that's basically it. Uh, and so also, so you guys know where we are, I'm, I am reading emails from this first email is from February 27th. Oh, and we, and we basically answer every question that is sent in to the Barbara Logic podcast, unless it is uh, inappropriate or just ridiculous. Those we just delete. Um, so we're at February. We, we got a little catching up to do. Yeah. So this question comes from Don. Uh, D A W N, which would which would indicate to me this is maybe our 29th female listener, um, mm-hmm. but it might not be. Oh, it actually says 24th female listener. She says on <laughs> the podcast. In fact, her question is: What is the best approach to maintaining some activity during a sciatica flare up? I felt some relief immediately after li- a lifting workout, but for the rest of that evening, the next day. My effective leg was a bit more prone to spasms, et cetera, and the flare-up continued to intensify sharply. What is? What are your experiences with sciatic nerve pain shooting down that leg? Oh no! Um, oh no! Yeah. Gonna, you guys, you guys, the you now panel. have negative. You have negative Jeopardy money currently. <laughs> you now have negative Jeopardy money. All right, all right. Get out of the way, Big Daddy. I'll answer this one for you guys. All right. First off, let me tell you, I actually, we need to make a video about this. I might have mentioned this once or twice on the podcast. Um, there, There is a stretch-ish thing that I learned from a really good physical therapist I had when I first started to have hip problems years ago. It works amazing. And so here's what you do. I'm going to try to explain it via audio, but it would work much better if we could just have a video for this. This needs to, we need to put this on the list of videos to make. So what you do is you take a pretty good size band like the jump stretch bands or the rogue bands that they sell at rogue i use the green ones at rogue which are the ones that are like what inch and a half wide inch and three quarters something somewhere in that ballpark right six inches Uh, (laughs) yes about about six inches that's exactly right Mm -hmm. wide and what you do is you sit on the floor with your feet out in front of you and you push your you sit against the wall so your back is against the wall your legs are on the floor straight out in front of you and you scoot your butt back against the wall as tight against the wall as you possibly can. So your body's making a perfect L and you should feel some hamstring stretch there. And in doing that, if you've got some sciatic nerve pain, you're going to feel it right then and there. What you do then is you take that band, you wrap it around one of your legs. Probably you're having sciatic nerve pain just down one leg, but I actually do this usually with both legs just because it's a good habit to get in. And I wrap the band around the insole mid of my midfoot and I pull on it like now I've got a hold of the band on each side of my foot like it's a and like my foot is a a horse and the band is like the reins of of a for a horse. Does that make sense? And I'm pulling on the right. I'm so I'm I can pull equally on the midfoot of both right and left side of one of my legs. But I don't pull equally. Instead, I pull really hard on one of the one of with one of my arms. So if I pull with if the band is around my right foot and I pull with my left arm, that is going to pronate my foot. Is that the right word? It's going to turn my foot in. Yep. I think that's right. Yep. And while pulling very hard on the inside band, I am going to then turn my foot out against the band very slow and very smooth. 10 times Hmm. and then I'm going to pull on the outside band and that's going to turn my foot to the outside and I am then going to move my foot to the inside against the band. I'm going to pronate against the band 10 times and that is what the world famous Kelly Starrett calls flossing 
the nerve. Now, I don't know if that's actually what is going on. Probably not, but I actually have no idea, but we can talk to our DPTs about it. But here's what I know. When you do this, it really improves sciatic nerve pain. Something is going on there with the nerve, and I think allowing the muscles to move around the nerve and not grab on that nerve, that it seems to free that thing up. And so if I'm having sciatic nerve pain, I will do that both before the workout that might affect it and after the workout that might affect it. And then I'm going to, from a volume perspective, sort of a, a heavy and in, in intensity versus volume perspective in the lifts, I'm still going to lift relatively heavy, but we're going to do the old, our, our favorite five sets of two-ish with a weight that we can handle pretty well with absolutely perfect form. So the weight might be 80% of what you were going to use. It might only be 60, but it's probably more like 80. And you're going to do five sets of two across with absolutely perfect form on both the squat and the deadlift. Do that little uh, sciatic nerve stretch with the bands while sitting on the floor and you usually feel pretty good at the end of that thing. You guys ever heard about doing that? No, I hadn't. No? Okay. There you go. You guys came to be on the podcast and then you, in yeah. fact, learned something. Have nothing. <laughs> Question two from our good friend Colin. You guys would know, mm -hmm. I know we know several Collins, so I won't, I won't say his last name, but it's a good Colin. We like this guy. Okay. And he talks a little bit about uh, the weight he's gained, and he's put on some thigh girth. And he says, uh, the problem is, is that his thighs are now so big that every pair of jeans he owns are now skinny jeans, and his thighs rub together all the time. Is this a cross I must bear for my newfound beautiful body I've sculpted with my barbells? <laughs> mm -hmm. If so, yeah, totally awesome. worth it. But do you have any tips or suggestions for me and my thighs? It's amazing how much we're talking about fashion on the podcast lately. <laughs> and um, Matt, you have some suggestions. This 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 comes up all the time on like our family Slack channel. People yeah. needing to get new clothes to make their new bodies look good, and it's important to do that, or else you just live in this. You live in like your old snake skin when you're like a new and better snake. So. What brand was it you were wearing this week, Matt? Bonobos? I love Bonobos shorts, and I love their chinos, their um, their khakis. What am I supposed to say? Hashtag not sponsored? Is that what it is? Mm. Hashtag not sponsored by Bonobos. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I really love Barbell Apparel jeans. Mm. And as of last week, hashtag sponsored. Um, <laughs> so they are actually a sponsor of the show. We haven't recorded ads for them yet. We don't let people advertise on the show unless we really like their product. So this will be a little free shout out to them. I love Barbell Apparel jeans because they are, number one, they're good looking jeans and they come in all the different colors. So they come in like, wh what, do you, what do you call like, what's the casual? Is it indigo or like kind of sort of like, it's not stonewash because that's 1986, but whatever that sort of like more casual color of blue is. They have that, but they also have like the really dark, nice, dressy jeans. Um, they're all the same price. The one thing about Barbell Apparel, and this will be, this is also, I think, an important note for for style, is that I think they mostly come in the same length, and then it's just known you go to a tailor and you get the yep. things, you get them, you get them hemmed. Getting a pair of jeans hemmed pretty much anywhere in the country is like ten bucks. So you go get them to the exact right length and they fit really, really well. The denim is really stretchy. It's got, I don't know, some, it's got like 17 direction stretches. Yeah. So I really like those jeans. And I, yeah, I like Bonobos for the, for the khakis. And I love Lulu's. Lulu makes some really nice, like all of Lulu's dress pants, khaki pants, Lululemon, also not sponsored, make really nice stretchy, um, comfortable pants that are that are made to now the downside is for all of those if your thighs really rub together eventually you're going to rub all the denim away and you'll get the little yeah. hole right at the yeah. crotch and then one day and you won't really notice it because it's it'll be paper thin one day and you'll mm -hmm. sit back on a park bench and cross your leg and it'll rip and then all your goods are hanging out yeah some of it some of it is just that it is the cross you have to bear um the cross but, you have to bear the crotch you have to bear. Uh, <laughs> that's that's where all of my pants wear out now since yeah. uh, since gaining weight. And about the only thing I can recommend that you not do is what I've been doing, which is you buy the the pants that fit, you know, like a shirt or pants that fit one 
aspect of your size, it's not going to fit everything else. So you got to get them tailored. Otherwise yeah. it's just going to look like you're wearing parachute yeah. shirts or clothes. Yeah. It's amazing how cheap a good tailor is. I mean, I, we're not talking about somebody who makes custom suits, which are nice to have. It's nice to have too. Are you drinking a jar of pickles, Andrew? <laughs> uh, today it's lemons. Slice of, oh, it's slice a jar lemons. of lemons. Okay. Is it at other times pickles? <laughs> it was so quick. I thought sometimes it is pickles. <laughs> it is so hot. He is so dehydrated. <laughs> <laughs> Nikki's doing the podcast. She doesn't have a shirt on, but she's she's pointed the camera way up, like way up at her like upper lip and above, so you can't see anything below her chin because she's so hot in in her house. And Andrew's drinking pickle juice, so yeah. that's how we know that's it's summer. Roll. That's how we know yep. it's that's how we know it's summer. Matt's right. like get custom suits, and I'm like I don't have air conditioning. <laughs> You're like I'm taking my shirt off. It's so damn hot. Yeah, no, a, a tailor's cheap, and uh, a good tailor should be able to do simple things like take in shirts and him. So when I when I when you buy a shirt, you buy a shirt with the right size shoulders and chest, and you get you can get the arms and waist taken in. That's the idea. And typically, the arms are going to be a little bit too long, and especially in a lot of button up shirts, they're going to need to be shortened just a little bit as well. They get real poofy. You don't want to be like the remember the old pirate shirt that Seinfeld wore. Remember that episode? The real poofy <laughs> white shirt. That's You don't want your button up to look like that. All right, next question. Luke, we get this question a lot. So so without reading the entire thing, Luke is a guy who is naturally, I would say naturally, he has become, he's worked really hard at getting strong and he's got his deadlift up to 430 for a set of five. His squat is 365 for a set of five, but his, but he's, his bench and press lag behind. So his bench is 190 for five, and his press is 135 for five. He's on a typical four-day split. Everything looks like he's doing things right. He's doing some LTEs at the end and some chins on upper body days. And he's like, what do I do to improve my upper body lifts? Lower body is just so much stronger and ahead of the upper body. How do you address that with your clients when your clients have – and maybe it's the other way around. Um, mm -hmm. how do, how, for people who have this, they just seem to be gifted in certain lifts and struggle with the others. Does Luke have really long arms? I wonder. <laughs> his deadlift is really good, and his upper body lifts are that far behind. Or it could be he's got really wide hips, yeah. and he's got you know he's just kind of built to squat and pull. Um, but that's well, kind of you know. The answer is to keep doing them and more of them. <laughs> like right. you need to do your accessory work because you want to put more mass onto your uh, onto your bones of your upper body. So chin ups for sure good job on the LTEs, get your curls in and you're probably going to need to add a third slot for bench or press. I would bench cause you can get, just get more weight on the bar. What do you think, Andrew? Yeah, I think that they tend to take longer to develop. Um, so if he's, I don't know how long he's been lifting, but sometimes it's just because you've got to put on more muscle mass, uh, to see the gains improve there. Um, you just might need more time and, and more food. I don't know if, what the diet looks like and whether he's, you know, uh, eating enough to also support that muscle growth, but yeah, more volume, more time. And, uh, for most people, if you think about it, for most people, most of us have lifts that come easier than others. Right. And yeah. Nikki's such an easy example because Nikki's built to deadlift so well, and she's an excellent deadlifter, but that also the trade-off there is she's got really long legs and she's got really long arms. And the trade-off is that makes squatting really hard. And so does that so the mean answer for me is just don't squat. <laughs> so typically, typically <laughs> the answer is <laughs> you do the thing, you just do the thing that you're good at, but you also do the thing you're bad at because yeah. Yeah. The, the these four other. main lifts make us better regardless. And so that, and that's really, I think what makes some of those great power lifters, people like an Ed Cohn who seem to be just like cut from stone to be exactly like the best power lifter of all time mm -hmm. uh, makes, that's what makes them that way. And they're just built where they don't really have any major deficiencies there. So it's kind of welcome to the club, man. It's part of the deal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that most guys from an aesthetics perspective would rather be really, really strong in the upper body and not as strong in the lower body. But I think that most of our people that understand what we do would rather be strong at the squat and deadlift. So there's a, there's a trade off, right? Like you can either yeah. be a pear shaped man, but really, really strong at squat and deadlifts. <laughs> <laughs> but your bench and press probably aren't that great, no. <laughs> you know, or you can have the, or you can have the chicken legs, but have the big upper body and, uh, show off at the beach, but you know, squatting deadlift sucks. So yeah, 
So, all right. Question from Jim. Uh, Jim asks if it is cheating, if it's okay to stand up to catch his breath while doing deadlift work sets. Is that considered a failure? So if he, you know, does a set of, he does his first two, lets go of the bar, stands up, catches his breath, goes back down and gets the third and so on and so forth. What, is that still a good lift? Is it still a PR? What do you think? I don't know if it's cheating, but I really don't think it's doing you any favors either. The longer you take to do a set, the more kind of accumulated, I don't know if this is the way to say it, but like the more very acute accumulated fatigue you have by rep five, right? So every time you stand up, it's like things are getting more and more tired over that amount of time. So by the last one, you've really just been doing the thing for too long. It could be that you're taking your breath at the wrong time. Maybe you're a bigger guy and have a big belly. So it's really tough to stand it, to stay down there. But what would be better is actually rolling the bar away from you so you have enough room to get a big breath and then roll it back to you instead of coming back up and going back down every time. So it's not cheating. Well, I don't know if I would let someone count that as a rep max, to be honest. It would depend on, to me, it would be how long did you take before you went back down there? Yeah. I stood there for 11 minutes and I went down for rep three. (laughs) Well, obviously... (laughs) At some point, yeah, that's, 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 for my that's, I think that's the catch 22 is that if it's short enough that you can actually get the rep, it's probably not actually helping you. Yeah, that's right. Uh, and if it's long enough that you actually recover, that it helps you, then it probably doesn't count. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So to me, the issue is that, you know, you, you need to be training to develop the conditioning to be able to do the work set that you're, you're trying to do because you're training, you know, that it, if you get your five RM and you have to take three breaths in between to get it done, that's, I don't know. I, I wouldn't get, I wouldn't be as fired up about that. I don't think personally I wouldn't count it for my own training, I guess, and put it that way. If a client needed to take a breath in between, I might say count it, but sure. in the long run, I'd rather have clients get it done without standing up. And the, the bigger issue here that we see more often is, just resting too long while staying down on the bar and holding on to the bar, right? right? True. They set the they set the rep down and then they take five breaths, but they but they don't stand up to catch their breath. They stay down on the bar because they think that standing up is cheating, but that taking five breaths instead of one isn't and is okay. And Not again, gonna, it's the same answer. Set over with. That's right. Yeah. It's the same answer that Nikki just. It never gets easier. Yeah. So how long should a set of five heavy deadlifts? Not not absolute ridiculous bone on bone grinder, but like a, just a good solid heavy set of five. How long should that last? Gosh, I have no idea. All the videos. Are there. That's amazing yeah, that you guys 30. haven't paid attention to that. I pay attention because I'm like, hey, I've been watching you deadlift five reps for one minute. And yeah, right. So long. you know if it's a minute, it's too long, right? <laughs> yeah. I think. I, I would, so right. I was going to say less than thirty seconds. Yeah, I think twenty seconds is like the is in the ballpark of yeah. If it takes 30 seconds to do a set of five on your deadlifts, then it's you You took too long. All four of the lifts, there's a cadence to, especially mm-hmm. with a, with sets that have multiple reps. There's mm-hmm. a cadence. I think the deadlift is the hardest one because it starts from a dead stop. Yeah. And especially the way we teach the press now, we teach the press with a rebound in the bottom where we take the break at the top, take mm-hmm. our, you know, breathe out, breathe in, down and right back up. And so it actually makes, to me, it makes the cadence on the press much easier the way we teach it. But the deadlift is difficult to get that cadence. You set the bar down, right? You breathe out, shins, chest, breathe, pull, set it down. Or maybe it's breathe, chest, pull. But there's that, there's, it's that, you gotta have that cadence. The weight shouldn't be on the floor longer than three or four seconds max, probably three seconds between reps. So there's a cadence to that. That's a good good question. Lots of people get, give me that question. Yeah, you need a little bit of a sense of urgency for sure. Um, so the advanced question would be why? What is it? What's physiologically going on that we want? What like, do you think? It, I think it has to do with the oxygen, the the oxygen piece. Yeah, right I mean, there. I think the the energy systems that you're using are changing over the course of that minute, yeah. as well. And you you know you start going over 45 seconds, and you're you're going into, um, you know, you're you're losing the ability to tap into all of your energy systems. Yeah. And leaning over is tiring right? Mm-hmm. Like you're smushing things that you need to breathe and you're, you actually are contracting some muscles, but you don't need those muscles to, you don't, you shouldn't be using those muscles to stop you from falling over. You should be using those muscles to do the deadlift. 
you're making certain things tired in the wrong way. Yeah, I was thinking, if you think about like when you do a really heavy set of deadlifts or squats, a set of five, and you get to really breathe in heavy, which I mean, if it's a really heavy set of five, it really doesn't matter how good a shape conditioning you're in. You breathe heavy at the end for a while, right? You sit there and like you, as a matter of fact, your your oxygen consumption and the, how hard you breathe actually seems to increase at the end of the set for another 20 or 30 seconds and then sort of peaks and then finally starts coming back down. And so I think there, there's a delayed response there in in oxygen consumption. So just like Andrew said, in the beginning, you're, you're using, you've got all this stored ATP and creatine, you know, that runs out. You're, it's not a heavy aerobic with oxygen sort of lift. So then I'm tapping into to glycogen, but like that's not nearly as, as uh, efficient as utilizing the stored energy and creatine, like the ATP CP pathway that I've had. And if I have to start getting into endurance level ox- oxygen for my, which some people do because they take a minute, 20 seconds to, to do their, their deadlift set. Like it's not, so you, you end up getting hypoxic. You don't have enough oxygen. You don't have enough energy. And you think the more breaths you take, you'll eventually catch up, but you just can't ever get caught up. So mm-hmm. just get the thing over with. It's way, way better. Uh, question from Sherry. Sherry tells some story. It looks like she's done very well in um, lifting and she's taken a bunch of our master classes. And, but she has the, the struggle that many have of elbow tendonitis. She's got elbow pain. And specifically, the squat seems to be the thing that's causing it. Her questions are, what steps do you go through for adjusting the squat grip to something non-standard? And how do you tell if it's right? She said, it seems logical that if it doesn't hurt when you squat, it's a good grip. But even with the grip that doesn't give me pain when I squat, I still experience increased aching in my elbows throughout the rest of the day. It's a tough question and probably something that a lot of people struggle with. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and not uncommon for tendonitis to you know, to be a delayed effect like that. I think sometimes it can be confusing because, uh, you're not sure what's causing it or, you know, what you think is causing it. So sometimes it can be the thing that you don't feel during the lift, but sometimes you have to experiment to see which one, uh, you don't feel after the lift and, um, until that symptom goes away. Um, and sometimes it may not even be the lift that's causing it. Maybe there's something else that you're doing, um, from one of the other lifts. So you suspect that it's the squat or maybe it originally started on the squat and now it's something else that's pissed it off after you've made some adjustment. So um, it's um, kind of a troubleshooting process where you've got to go through and, and try to find the thing that in theory is causing it um, and try to treat the symptoms as best you can. But sometimes you can never, sometimes it just goes away. And that's, yeah. that's sometimes one of the most frustrating things about that type of uh, symptom is you never actually know exactly what was that caused it. So you kind of work around it until it, until it moves on. Yeah. Um, and there's different things you can do. You know, I think for, for the elbow tendonitis in particular, uh, surprisingly, I think a lot of times bringing in the narrower, in a narrower grip can make the elbow tendonitis uh, go away. Um, but other times a wider grip helps because the um, narrower tends to put the forearm more in compression and it doesn't have any, it gets most of the moment out of the way or why, why do you think a narrower grip would help? You get your meat shelf tighter yeah. so that get a tighter the shelf hold the bar. It's actually on a shelf, right? Which is what yeah. I was going to say. Like her question of like, how do you know if it's right? Well, like that's a hard question to answer on a podcast on an audio mm-hmm. podcast where we can't see her grip or anybody's grip. But the, the, the first, going back to the one rule, the easy one rule of squat grip is you should feel the weight of the bar on your meat shelf. On your back, yep. Not in your hands, in your wrist, in your elbows, in your forearms. So if you feel the weight of the bar in your arms, it's not right. We know that a correct squat is going to, you're going to feel the bulk of the weight on your back on that meat shelf of muscle and whether your thumbs are on top of the bar or thumbs are wrapped around the bar or whether you've got a wide grip or a narrow grip. It's, so it's weird. I've been playing around just because I'm old and beat up with the buffalo bar slash duffalo bar a lot lately. And today, for the first time in a while, I squatted with the straight bar. And it took some time to get in position with the straight bar. Bro, so much better with the straight bar. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Why? Because it was so much tighter. Right. You can be you can be so loose on a buffalo bar. You know, you're squatting with kind of like semi your thoracics and semi flexion. It feels mm-hmm. it feels great and it doesn't bother your elbows at all. And I don't have any pain with it. But I thought you know, the reason I did it is I'm 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 gonna go I'm, we're gonna travel here in a few weeks and I'm gonna go to a gym that I know doesn't have it. I'm gonna need to squat with a straight bar. And I thought, you know, I better start practicing with that right now and stop screwing around with this Buffalo bar for a few weeks and get used to it. And it was crazy because yep. then I noticed like, oh man, this thing's way more seated in, on yeah. my back. It feels way tighter. So so here's an easier question from her. Her follow-up question is, I know I'm going to throw this one at Sims. At what point do you take time off from the lift and go to something else and for and for how long? Like when do we take time off for tendonitis? Oh, man. If it gets to the point that it's hurting in most of your lifts and if it's hurting outside of the gym and you've tried exploring a lot of different variations of the lift or different frequencies and different weights, and there's no indication of it improving, then that might be the right time to just eliminate it. But I think there needs to be time when you like what you've done, you found a grip that doesn't hurt. And then 10 nights takes a long time to go away. Like, I don't know how long you've made that correction or still feeling it in your other lifts, but it might just need a few more weeks. So if it starts really, if you really start feeling it outside the gym, that's usually when I start to take um, more significant approaches and by eliminating the lift, but it's very uh, last case kind of thing. Yep. Uh, All right. Last question for today. This is from Thomas. This is an interesting kind of similar question, but now we're not talking about tendonitis. We're talking about back pain. So Thomas has continued to try to go through linear progression. He continues to feel a tight, achy feeling in my low back near my spine. Feel it all the time with training. It's, you know, there's this pain, and it, but it doesn't seem like it's a it's a nine out of 10 pain or a 10 out of 10 pain. It's just this kind of constant all the time. Seems like he struggles with his tight, achy back. Uh, my question is whether you would recommend trying to resolve the pain issues in my back before attempting to take up the squat and deadlift again. If not, what are the common mistakes that I could be making? And then here's an important stat in case it's pertinent to your answer, and it is. Um, he is 5'11 and 165. There you go. So he and I are the same. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the clear answer, in my opinion, would be he needs to eat more. Yeah. And there may be some movement errors that are occurring, maybe overextending his back in the, mm-hmm. at the top of the squat. Um, that one I see a lot lately. Which is possible uh, when you're 5'11 and 165. Quite right, possible. The gaining weight would help with that um, potentially. So yeah, uh, that would that would those would be the first two areas that I would probably look is to see what what's happening with his back during the squat and can we put some weight on? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You need to see what's going on with your form that would be causing that. Yeah. Agreed. So. Thomas, one thing you can do is you can email experience at barbell-logic.com and have one of our coaches look at your lifts, specifically your squat and deadlift. Let's see what we can find. But I would bet if you gain 15 pounds, it would help tremendously. 15 pounds is 180. is 5'11 in weight. So I'm not talking about making you a big, giant, fat guy. We're talking about 15 mm-hmm. pounds of body weight probably will make a significant difference. And then the, the uh, obviously we're not doctors and we don't know every situation, but for a blanketed answer, dealing with back pain, especially when you're talking about not sharp back pain, not sharp sciatic nerve s- spasms, but tight, achy, sore back pain is not the same thing as dealing with really bad elbow tendonitis. Because sometimes Mm -hmm. elbow tendonitis gets so bad that we have to change something. But our experience in general is is that squats and deadlifts are the movements that will help fix the back pain when the primary back pain you have is tight and a tight, achy back. It's not to take a break from squat and deadlifts, get weaker, you know, lose muscle mass, and then come back and hope that the back pain will have have resolved itself almost always when you do that by the way almost always when you do that with tendonitis the most frustrating thing ever is to take a month off of something let it feel like you're letting it heal and then come back and one or two workouts in whammo there it is again you're like i've literally just wasted a month and the answer is yep you literally just wasted a month 
So, you know, you've got some free coaching options there with experience. Always, you can always get yourself uh, a good coach, whether in person or online. Um, gain a little weight, eat a, eat a little more protein, put on 15 pounds, and I will almost guarantee you that that back pain will go away. So that is another Q&A edition of the Barbell Logic podcast uh, with my good friends, uh, coworkers, VPs, partners in crime, and everything else. <laughs> uh, Andrew and Andrew Jackson and Nikki Sims, thank you for listening. Uh, you can always send your questions to questions at barbell-logic.com, and we will get to them eventually. We got through February. We're pushing into the questions that came in in March. We are now now answering uh, in mid-June, so we're not horribly <laughs> behind, but they come in fast and furious. So we need to do some rapid fire on these at some point. So if we <laughs> knock out like 23 questions or something in a single, yeah. like five in five words or less, we could do it. That could be, that could be fun. Uh, so thank you for listening we love a five star review at iTunes or anywhere that you listen to this podcast tell a friend and it's let's see it's Thursday so we will see you on Sunday for the principal series see you soon